good to be here. I echo my daughter Grace and say happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. Uh, hopefully you will celebrate that and that would be a blessing to you. And But for now that we would come once again to the Word of God. But before we do that, I have a couple announcements. One thing what I'd like to do right now is just uh, go to the Lord in prayer, if we could, together for our brother. Pastor Joe, he came through the surgery, he's doing well, there's some post-op, is that the right way to say that, post-after operation, uh, things that he needs to do, but the report is that he went through the surgery really well, and hopefully they'll be sending him back to us soon. Uh, so I want to pray for Joe, and Sister Sandy called this morning, Sandy's usually in charge of the bulletins, and Sandy's like my left arm, uh, and so she got, she's sick. And it's not good for Sandy to be sick because of her lung condition and cancer and all that. And so let's pray for those couple folks. Uh, before we do one last ne next week we'll take a love offering for uh, Pastor Joe and Cindy. Uh, their travel to Texas for this operation, I'm quite certain, has taken its toll. And so all that we can do to help them will be greatly appreciated. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father and our God, we come boldly before your throne of grace. Lord, you've commanded us to do so, and we thank you for that. We know that you are a God who hears us. We know that you are a God who answers according to your will. And so, Father, we pray that by your grace and through your love and by your mercy, we pray for Brother Joe and Sister Cindy and ask, Lord, that you would continue to open up the doors of blessing, that you would continue to open up your grace and your mercy to them, and that they might cast themselves upon it as they have in the past. Father, that you would strengthen, that you would encourage, that you would cause now healing, that we would hear more reports from the doctors of good news, that things are going well, that his heart is doing what it should be doing. Father, that you would help them in this time of need. I know financially it's very expensive, and we pray, Lord, that you would meet every need that they have. We pray, Father, that you would give them a great uh, understanding of your love towards them, and because of your love towards them, Lord, that it would also be our love as the local church, as Faith Baptist Fellowship, that we would surround them as well and love them even as Christ has loved us. So, Father, bless as only you can. Father, I pray for their travels, that you would help them to come back safely and that everything would go well. Lord, we can't help but think of Job through these struggles in the deep waters of trial. We also believe, Father, that you are a God who is not out of control of any of this, but that you are working all things together for their good, and we praise you for it, even though we may not understand it. So, Lord... Help them and us to line up with that teaching, with that great grace that our God is a God whose suffering is not out of your control, but you purpose it, you plan it, and you use it for your glory and our good. Father, we pray also for Sister Sandy, and we beg of thee, Lord, that you would bless her this hour, that you would help her to uh, feel better, that she would overcome that this sickness wouldn't be something that lingers and hangs on, but that it would be something short, a period of time that as she goes through it, she would overcome it quickly, that she would feel better. Father, I pray that she would know that we love her and that you love her and that, that she would just rest in your love and your grace and your mercy. Upon this portion of our service, where we have come together and we have fellowshiped already. We have greeted one another and embraced one another and welcomed one another, and we've joined our voices together to sing praise unto the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And now, Lord, as we come to this time where we come under your word for the preaching and teaching of it, Lord, we ask that you might give us the ability to comprehend, to understand that you would reveal yourself to us through your word and that we might worship you, that we might adore, that we might stand in awe, that we might have hearts that are filled with honor and praise to you, our God. Do that, Father, as only you can, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We come once again to the book of Acts this morning, and by way of a title, I would submit to you the mission and mutual care of the community. 
the mission and mutual care of the community. Let's read it, and then we'll jump right in. So this is Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 37, the end of this great chapter, which really, uh, it really, the chapter breaks aren't there in the original. So when you read the book of Acts, it's important, I think, to, to continue to read. Don't let the chapter breaks deter you from looking at where uh, the writer, who is Luke in this case, is shifting gears and doing what he's doing. But let's read 32 to 37, and then I'll preach. And the multitude of those that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them, any of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Kind of an interesting account as we come to this chapter, the end of this chapter in the book of Acts. It's kind of a, uh, it seems as though as you read it, it's almost like a break. Remember where we're, where we're coming from in this chapter. If you remember Peter and John, here I go, I'm going to preach the last two weeks of sermons again this week and then start new. But if you remember, Peter and John go up to the temple to pray, and there's this lame man who was lame from his birth, over 40 years old, and they see him begging at the gate, and their eyes meet, and Peter says to him, Silver and gold have I none, but what I do have I giveth unto thee. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise and walk. And of course, the man rises and walks. A great miracle has taken place, and he's leaping up and down the aisles within the temple, and it draws the crowd, it draws all this attention. And of course, Peter and John expressing to them, I don't know why you're looking at us as though we did anything by our own power, our own holiness, our integrity. This man is here standing well before you because of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And he preaches the resurrection, doesn't he? He preaches. Uh, we're given in part the passages of Scripture that he used. I believe it was Psalm 119, Psalm 110. Correct me if I'm wrong, Bill. You should check that out. <clears throat> but he preaches, doesn't he? He proclaims the Lord Jesus Christ and how that through faith, faith in his name, this man stands well here before you. And of course, you remember that kind of arouses the religious leaders, doesn't it? They, they, they hear the report. They got all this clamor. There's a gathering going on. What took place down there? Some guy got healed. Well, we better go down there and check it out. Hopefully no one's practicing any kind of black magic. I'm sure the Sadducees heard about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you'll remember, the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. And so as they come about and come around, here's Peter and John and the lame man standing next to them. And they pretty much, what's going on here? And it's late in the day, so they say, let's throw them in jail tonight and we'll have a council meeting in the morning. And so that's what happens. And of course, Peter and John and the lame man stand there. And Peter boldly professes to them, if we're standing here for this good deed done to this man, let it be known unto you that this man is standing here right now, basically because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he preaches Christ to them. And because all of the people in that area saw and witnessed the miracle, heard the preaching and teaching of Peter and John, and they're praising God for this great miracle that's been done because the lame man's been there a long time. And now they stand back and they see this guy. Like, we know him. We walked by here for years and he was the common beggar. And now here he is standing. Here he is, the one who begged for all those years. He's, he's healed. And so they can't deny it. And so, you remember, they let them go with great, great threatenings. Don't teach or preach in this name anymore. 
You remember the account, of course, whether it is right for us to listen to you or to God, you decide. But we're going out there and we're going to keep preaching Jesus. We can't help but talk about the things which we have seen. These are eyewitnesses to the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. These men have seen Jesus Christ ascending into heaven. They can't help but preach, proclaim, talk about, manifest, testify of the glory and the grace of God as it is found in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the truth is, beloved, if you're a child of God this morning, that should be the same testimony of all of us. I have seen by faith the Lord Jesus Christ. I haven't seen him physically. I wasn't an eyewitness to the literal resurrection. I wasn't there at that time. But by divine grace, by God's favor upon me, through his word, by faith, Brother Dean, we have eyes to see, don't we? And we testify of that glory and that grace of an of a ascended, resurrected, seated at the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning, returning Christ. Amen? We should be able to say the same thing. I can't help but speak about the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. I can't help but talk about His resurrection. I can't help but talk about His death, His burial, His ascent into heaven, His promise of return. I can't help but talk about it. Amen, Tam? That's how we should be. The reality of the resurrection, the reality of the work of Christ must be a reality within our minds and within our hearts. And when that becomes a reality, by divine grace in the mind and heart of a child of God, you have to get it out. Amen? Not only verbally, but it has to come out in life. Make no mistake, beloved, yes, Witnessing verbally, testifying the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ to people by the words of our mouth or through our lips, by our tongues, is a glory and a blessing, and it should be a conviction in each and every child of God. But if that's all it is, guess what? It ain't worth nothing. To be one who just speaks with their lips and does nothing with the way they live, it is powerless. And I think that's what we come to see here. It seems as though, remember, as Peter and John go back into the church, they declare to them what things were said by the council, and what do they do? Well, we better go to prayer, shouldn't we? And they join their voices together with one accord, it says in Acts chapter 4. And they pray to the living God, and they understand His sovereignty and His power and His grace and that great prayer goes up, and you remember at the end of the prayer, and the whole place shook, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. God answered their prayer. They know who God is. They understand the resurrected Christ. They understand that He's still in control. Even though He was crucified, He raised from the dead. They saw Him ascend into heaven. And now Luke, recording what he records in the book of Acts, you remember, for most excellent Theophilus and us wants Him and us to understand that Jesus isn't dead and gone. Jesus isn't away in some distant place where he doesn't know what's going on here. No, he's still very much in control. His people are going to be saved. His church is going to grow, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He's in charge of all of it. And so, of course, they're filled with the Holy Spirit. Of course, they go and speak the word of God with boldness. And then we come to the words in which I read earlier. And so not only do we see or have we seen from the last couple of weeks that these early believers availed themselves to the throne of grace as the report of Peter and John come to them, they quickly go to prayer, and the Lord answers their prayer. And so as they lift their voice with one accord, we see also that they live their lives in one accord. Not only do we see the, the power of their prayer, but here we see the power in their fellowship. 
This isn't something strange. We've seen glimpses of this back in Acts chapter 2 as I preached through that. You remember on that day of Pentecost as people got saved and people were added unto the church and they were the participating in fellowship and in the apostles' doctrine and the breaking of bread and they went from house to house and they did eat their bread with gladness, didn't they? And so it's a continuation of that here, but it's kind of an interesting account. It's somewhat Luke is giving a summary of what's going on. So yes, there's persecution here, but there's also a boldness of teaching and preaching. But not only is there a boldness in teaching and preaching, there's a boldness in a coming together of one accord in prayer. But not only is there a boldness in preaching and teaching and coming together in prayer, there's a boldness and a faithfulness and a power in their communing with one another in their fellowship. It's as, as, as if it, Luke is saying, just look at how they live. And that's where we pick it up. Verse 32, very important words, and the multitude of those that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Those that believed. Here is a group, a community of people, the church, the body of Christ, they are those who believe, those who have yielded themselves by divine grace through faith to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in obedience to his teaching. Luke is telling Theophilus here and us as well that these people are marked by unity. They are believers and they are of one heart, they are of one soul, or of one mind. They believed, and because they believed, they were of one heart and one soul. The believing, or the oneness, or unity of heart and soul, is a result of believing. That's important. Why? because of what the Lord Jesus Christ himself said. What did, he, what, did he command? what did he command us? A new commandment I give unto you. What is that command? That ye love one another. How? Even as I have loved you. You better be of one heart. You better be of one soul. You better be loving each other even as I have loved you. Why? Not, not, just, be, not just the law. Not just the checkbox. This is the very essence and nature of who I have made you to be as new creatures in Christ Jesus. That is the very aspect. This is the very essence of Christianity. You're going to have a love for one another that is not experienced anywhere else in the world. It is exclusive to those who believe. In the world has tried to get this kind of unity apart from Christianity, and guess what happens? It ends up in disaster. This is not ecumenicalism. What's that? Ecumenicalism is primarily a, a thought, a system that says if we all just hold hands, if we can all just get along, you know, if we could get the Baptists and the Muslims and the Jehovah Witnesses and the Mormons and the Pentecostals and the Roman Catholics, if we just got all of them together in the same room and held hands, there would be unity. No, there wouldn't. It won't work. Why? Because most of those, or in all of them, there's unbelief. This is specific to those who believed. This kind of unity is not created by them. It is kept by them. Let me say it to you this way, by means and way of better application. God does not command us to create unity. He commands us to keep it. That's the command in Ephesians chapter 4, isn't it? Endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. You don't create the unity. The unity was created by God himself. This love for one another, this care for one another, this support of one another, this embracing of one another, all of that is created by God. We are commanded by God to simply keep it. And this is exactly what the early church is doing, aren't they? 
They're not creating it. They're simply keeping it. They're living it out. They're expressing it in their lives. This is not ecumenicalism. This isn't communism. This isn't a thing where people come and say, hey, you have that and I want it, so I'm just going to take it. It's not that. This is voluntary. It's free. They're simply doing, this is what I have, and what I have belongs to you. I'll share it with you. Simply amazing. And the world has tried to establish or create this kind of unity all through social, economical, and political reveals. And guess what? It never, ever works. There's always some group or some person who's getting fatter than everybody else or filling their pockets more than everybody else. It doesn't work. The only true unity that can be found as this is described here is in Christ Jesus. It is exclusive for believers. Isn't that what it says? This does not apply to the religious leaders outside of this community. This does not apply to the unbelieving Jews outside of this community. This does not apply to those who are apart from Christ and enemies of His. They don't have this kind of unity. This is something special. This is something unique. And praise God, I have experienced it here more than anywhere. The multitude of those that believed were of one heart and of one soul. What does it mean? What does it mean to be of one heart and one soul? It's a good question, isn't it? That's how we should read the text. What, what, what do you mean they were of one heart? What do you mean they were of one soul? And at the heart of it, of course, is they're unified. They're, they're, they're like this. There's not a group of them over here and a group of them over here and they're doing this and none of that. That comes <laughs> and it's dealt with and handled under leadership, isn't it? Under biblical precedent, under apostolic authority. It happens, doesn't it? It's going to happen in Acts chapter 5. It's going to happen in Acts chapter 6. But we see how it's handled. But as the early start from chapter 2 and now into chapter 4, what does it mean? What does it mean that these believers are of one heart, of one soul? Well, one heart, I would say this. The whole community, the group of them, they are all moved by one great impulse. One love has mastered them all. They have one outlook, an inward conscience, and one inspirational motive. They're of one heart. One love is driving them. What love is that? They're all on the same page as concerning who has loved them. Amen? They're all on the same page of there was a great sacrifice given not just for me, but also for you too. And because that sacrifice was given to you, I am inspired. I am mastered by that love to pour out my love for you. They're of one heart. There's no one looking around saying, well, I'm better than that person. I'm better off than him, or I'm better off than her, or I have more gifts than this person. And that. that all comes, doesn't it? Look at 1 Corinthians when Paul starts to write to them. And look at what he says to them. You remember? If one member suffers, don't all the members suffer with it? Oh, Corinthians, have you forgotten the very essence of what Christ has accomplished and done for you, to you, with you, through you? Or when one member rejoices, don't all the other members rejoice with it? That's what's going on here. Someone sees a need, they're not afraid to go and sell everything they have in order to meet that need. They're of one heart. They have come to the conviction, they have come to the realization, they have come to the understanding that the Lord Jesus Christ, that God himself has given the sacrifice of his only begotten son, his one and only beloved son, Nick, for you and for all of his people. And therefore, we have that in common with. of 
one soul. The word really is life. They're of the same heart, one heart, one soul, one life, one life lived for the glory of God and the salvation and the edification of his people, which brings him glory. That's what they're all about. It's no longer, it's no longer, what, ab what about my agenda? It's, it's not simply living life on the outskirts or coming into a church once a week, Sunday morning, doing a little bit of worship, taking care of some business, shaking some hands, giving some hugs, and then walking out that door as if none of those people ever existed. It's not that at all, is it? This is their life. The church, the body of Christ, believers, glorifying God, edifying the saints, coming together in fellowship, worshiping God, proclaiming His Word, and on and on and on and on for the glory of God. That is their life. How does that work? How do you do that? How do I, as a part-time mason, would I describe it now? my heart of hearts, I'm a pastor. But I do mason work. Not really mason work anymore. I keep saying that, but I'm pouring probably 60 yards of concrete here pretty soon. I don't know what's wrong with me. How do I take that? How do you go out in your daily lives and live in such a way where the very essence of your life is the people of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, God, theology, doctrine, edification, sanctification, witness and testimony to the lost, entertainment, going to the movie with your wife or spending a fellowship dinner with friends. How does that, how does that all go together where we all have this sharing of one life? Well, it goes together like this. The most important part, the very essence of my life is revolved around or centered in the very essence of what the Lord Jesus Christ has accomplished in and through his body. And so when I go to pour concrete, I pour concrete for the glory of God. When I go to work, I go to work for the glory of God. I witness to people. I oftentimes have Christian brothers that are there with me. And as we're working, we talk about the Lord. We talk about doctrine. We're concerned about spiritual things. We point sin out in each other's lives. And all of this begins to build into, hey, amen, amen, amen. That's right. We're, we're all about not the world. We're all about the kingdom of God, are we not? Or shouldn't we be? It's not just about how much money I can make or how many things I can buy or how many toys I can have. It's not about that at all. But rather it's about the glory of God and the edification of His saints. How I can help His people to grow and to feel full and to be satisfied in Christ Jesus. That's what it's all about. Let's look at quickly some principles that flow out of this. I know that as we read in the text, oftentimes people start with just that reaction of what they did. Those who had houses or lands, they sold them and they brought the money, the proceeds from that sale, they brought it and they laid it at the apostles' feet. Simply amazing. <clears throat> we'll have more to say about that in a minute. But let's look real quick. That's what, that's what they did. So here they are, here are these people, one accord, one mind, one heart. They're gathered together, and as they see needs arise in this community, what they do is meet those needs. They do that by means and way of selling possessions and bringing it. Understand also at this particular point in time, this is a time of persecution. This is a very early time in the church. And remember, from even Pentecost, you have the dysphoria. Those Jews who were dispersed throughout, they were in Jerusalem to come and celebrate the what feast? The Passover, right? Passover feast. 
They were there to celebrate that kind of interesting. God has set it up that even as the Lord Jesus Christ is the Passover lamb, here they are celebrating this in an Old Testament context, and God is saying Jesus is the fulfillment of that. He is the Passover lamb. He is the sacrifice. But they're from the dysphoria. They don't, they don't have, the, as they come in, Pentecost happens, and now Peter preaches, 5,000 more people at it. They don't have a place to go back to. We'll just stay here. We'll gather together. We'll meet from house to house. There are people who have places. We'll, we'll have house church. We'll get together. We're going to sit under teaching. We're going to grow. We're going to learn. And guess what? With that many people that fast, a lot of needs arise, don't they? There's no means also, as well as this, if you're a Jew in Jerusalem and you're pro proclaiming Christ, that you got saved by Jesus the Nazarene, that you're no longer uh, part and parcel with Judaism, but now you're a Christian, a follower of Jesus, you ain't going to buy nothing in there. There are people who are going to cast you out. You're going to be looked at as an outcast. And so needs arise, and this is what they do. We're told... Neither, of, neither, neither said any of them that any of the things which he possessed was his own. Nobody's going around saying that this, this, this is my house. It doesn't belong to you. This is mine. Keep out. Stay away. No, they're actually taking it and selling their possession and then bringing the money that they have in their possession. They set it at the apostles' feet, leaving the, de the, de the decision and the distribution of those needs to, to whoever needs most. And no one lacks anything. So let's look at some principles that flow out of this mindset, this fellowship, this worship. Number one, if you're taking notes, I think the first principle you see is selflessness. They are selfless. The unity they shared in Christ ended all selfishness. And it's quite amazing because we live in a world today, do we not, beloved, where selfishness, selfism, is at a mountaintop right now. It's all about me, my. We, we call the things we own, the houses and properties we own, this is a real estate. It belongs to me. Took me a long time to work to get all that, you know. A lot of hard blood, sweat, and tears. It belongs to me and nobody else. The whole idea and realm in which we live in Christianity today, it's marked by selfism. It belongs to us. Why would I share it with anybody? This is something we see here, principle number one, is that it, 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 this, this unity with the Lord Jesus Christ, this relationship with Him, brings with it a selflessness. They're not being selfish. Number two, I think a principle we learn, even as it's said, not only were they of one heart and of one soul, but neither, none of them said that any of the things which He possessed was His own but they all had things common. The second thing I think we see here is there's a corporate consciousness. They have a conscience that is convicted or convinced by a corporate aspect that I think we see. They recognized God's ownership of everything. They recognized that, didn't they? No one's going around saying, this is mine. This is my own. No. They look at the things they have, and I think they come to an understanding. God owns all of it anyway, doesn't he? This all belongs to God. They realized all of it belongs to him, and if it belongs to him, it belongs also to his people. Because God had touched their lives so deeply, they found it easy to share all things common. Wow. Brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so has a need. I have something that can help that need. It all belongs to God anyway. I'm going to do whatever is necessary to meet the needs of brother or sister so-and-so or the church as a whole. Wow. This, this is sharp. It's sharp. But think about it. How far away have we gotten from this principle? Just how far away have we gotten? I'm not saying this is what's interesting about this passage of Scripture. Nowhere is it a command. 
Nowhere is it under compulsion. Nowhere did the apostles come up, and nowhere in the Bible are you going to find God saying, if you own a house, or you own land, or you're a wealthy person, just give everything you have away. You're not going to find it. It's not there. But this is something that stems out of a need, a great need is there, and instead of turning their back on it or turning away from it, they're, they're, they, 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 out of a voluntary will, they come because of the love of God, because of the love of Christ, because of what Christ has accomplished and done in them. They love one another and say, you have a need, I can meet it. It's going to take sacrifice, but I love you, and that's what's going to happen. Where today, in most places, it's somebody else's problem. Or we don't really have the finances for that. We have money for lots of other things. But, but we can't help so-and-so. They had a corporate consciousness. Number three, they had a conviction of the supremacy of the spiritual over the material. Mark that one well. They had a conviction of the supremacy of the spiritual over the material. Verses 34 once again in 37, neither was there any among them that lacked for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold. Then we have this as a particular illustration in Barnabas and it says he himself came having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles feet. The spiritual had a supremacy over the material. The very life of the Spirit of Christ within them made the question of prosperity, wealth, all material things, a secondary question. All material things were subservient to spiritual purpose. What do they say? None of this belongs to me. It all belongs to God. Do whatever you want with it. If it's going to benefit the spiritual, I'll use my material to benefit the spiritual. We don't think like that in, in Western civilization. We really don't. Uh, shame on me, I shouldn't say we. Maybe I should say I. I will say I. But I need to start thinking that way. The material ought to be something that brings about supports, supplies the spiritual. And so oftentimes, I have it backwards. So oftentimes in my own heart, and my own life, it's the material that really shows forth the spiritual. No, it's not. It's not there for that reason. I am a very blessed man. God has blessed me greatly. I have a home, I have land, I have cars, I have a hot rod, I have all kinds of things. I have children, I have all kinds of material blessing. The reality is, is those material blessings are there to help out, manifest, support, bring glory to God in the spiritual. Is that right? That's right. Don't get that backwards. Don't lose the reality of what's going on here. These people had a conviction of the supremacy of the spiritual over the material. There are some people, people in this church, it's simply amazing. I am, I'm amazed at the way they believe and the way they think and the way they just Give it all away. Large sums of money. And use it in a way that sometimes I can look at and say, that's just foolish. <laughs> but their attitude is, it's the Lord's anyway, it'll come back. Just keep being a conduit. Just keep letting it flow. Not holding on to that. They held on to the things of the world very loosely. 
very loosely. Whatever was needed to benefit the spiritual, whatever was needed to benefit the edification of the saints, the children of God, and bring him glory, they used the material for that reason. This unity was a wonderful work of the Holy Spirit in them. Because of their unity, because of what Jesus Christ had done to them, they regarded people more important than things. They regarded people more important than things. Number four, last but certainly not least, and there's lots more I'm quite certain that we can pull from it. I've said it already, I say it again because I think it bears testimony, it bears record. They had all things common. They sold their houses, they sold their lands, they sold their material possessions to benefit the spiritual needs of the congregation of the early community. And once again, there is no command, there is no compulsion. This is not done out of law. It is completely and absolutely voluntary. It is an outward expression flowing from an inward conviction. How do I know that? How do I know it's voluntary? Well, if we go to Acts chapter 5 real quick, we get into a problem here with Ananias and Sapphira. You remember Ananias and Sapphira had a piece of land, and they sold it for a certain amount of money, but rather than giving all the money, they held back a portion of the money, said, no, we sold it for this price. They lied, and they set that down. And of course, the apostles know that and understand that, and Ananias, dead. Fire walks in, dead. There's discipline in the early community as well. We're going to learn about that, Lord willing, next week. But notice what, I believe it's Peter, says to them. This is how we know it's voluntary. Verse 3 of chapter 5, But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the price of the land? Look at what he says, verse 4. While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? In other words, Ananias this land belonged to you. After you sold it, the money belonged to you. You could do whatever you want with it. But to come and lie about it, that's where it was wrong. Ananias and Sapphira, they weren't wrong for bringing the portion they brought. They weren't wrong for selling their property. It was all of theirs. It belonged to them. What was wrong is they lied. When you owned it, wasn't it yours? It was in your power to do whatever you want with it. You could have done whatever you want with it. Nobody's commanding you to sell it and bring the money here. This isn't law. So it's voluntary. This is something that's in the heart of the early church. This is something that ought to be in the heart of each and every child of God here this morning. What does that look like? Well, again, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that this passage of Scripture is talking about, well, hey, if you have a house, you better go sell it tonight and then bring the money here. And just, I'm not saying that. I the Bible to try and teach us that, but it is trying to teach us this. In the community of Christ, the church of Christ, the, the true heart of each and every believer, shouldn't it be for us to desire to see the benefit of everybody? Shouldn't it be our desire to see the needs of those who are in need to be met? Shouldn't it be that? Shouldn't we go through great sacrifice in order to make that happen? Shouldn't we do that? I think that's what it's here. That's what it's all about. Side note, I forgot my phone in the truck, so I don't know what time it is. So I'm probably still early. Side note, 
There's some of this that could be dangerous in the minds of even Christian people. Some of this could be dangerous in the minds of some Christian people because they can have the idea or thought where they kind of become freeloaders on the church. We're taught about that in the book of 1 Thessalonians as well. For some people, they just, well, I, I, you know, what, what they really need is not the church to give them a handout. What they really need is a job. Isn't that what Paul writes in the, the book of Thessalonians? If any of you aren't working, don't expect to come and eat something if you're not providing for yourself already. If you can go to work and you can earn a living and you can make money and you're not doing that, don't expect to belly up to the table and fill your gut. You should be working. And the problem there, of course, was, well, the Lord's going to return soon anyway. Why go to work? Why provide for anything? Why have any kind of uh, job or anything like that? We'll just stand around, wait, pool all our money together, <laughs> and then uh, when the Lord comes back, everything will be good. No. You have the ability to work? Go to work. Go do something. Go make money. Provide for yourself and your family. That, that needs to be preached too, doesn't it? Definitely needs to be preached. Young man last week, don't know his name, don't even know who he is. Uh, a member here had the opportunity to try and help him in a way. He needed money, he was on hard times, this, that, and the other thing. And he says, all right, well, I'll help you out. What I want you to do is I want you to call me at 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. And when you call me at 7 o'clock tomorrow morning, I'll send one of my guys to pick you up and I'll give you a job. That's how I'll help you. Well, guess what time he called? 10.30. No joke. 10.30. Hello? Did you just get out of bed? This is what happens with a lot of people. So we don't use this as a platform to encourage freeloading. Don't get me wrong. There's lots of needs within the church. Our brother Joe is going to have some big needs. We should meet them as much as we possibly can. I don't know if he'd want me sharing this or not, but I'll ask for forgiveness later. 90 grand. Is that right? 90 grand out of pocket, and they're still fighting with the insurance companies. But he decided, I'm going to get the surgery because that's what I need. So he did. There's great needs. Our hearts, our one-heartedness, our one soul, our one life together looks at those needs and say, Let, let's meet them. Why? Because Jesus loves us. That's why. <laughs> and because he loves us, we love one another. Amen? That's, that's true Christianity. That's what's happening here. I got to go on. Not only do they have power in prayer early chapter 4. Not only do they have power in fellowship here, middle of chapter 4, but they have power in their witness. They have power in their testimony. Notice what it says in verse 33. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection and of the Lord Jesus and great grace. I love, I love the words. Great grace was upon them all. So there's great power in the witness and there's great grace upon them all. Great power, great grace. The apostolic witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ was with great power, Luke tells us. And there could be no doubt, there is no doubt that this is the power of God. The power of God expressed in and through their preaching, in and through their teaching. The power of God testifying through the scriptures. There's no question about it. I know that we'll, we'll read in the book of Acts more sermons that come up as they take the word of God and they pro proclaim, this is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What Moses was talking about, what David was talking about, what all the Old Testament prophets were talking about, fulfilled in the Lord resurrected Jesus Christ. Great power in preaching. Great power in testifying, eyewitness testimony. I seen the man dead. And I seen the man alive again. Great power. The power of God. But I would also submit to you this morning, their witness was made powerful 
by the spirituality and the selflessness of the congregation. Did you get that? Not only was it, yes, the power of God by His divine grace, the Spirit in equipping them, encouraging them, helping them to remember, to proclaim, to preach what they seen, what they know to be true from the Scriptures, but I believe that this great power that was there was also because of the way the, the church was living their life. In other words... Without the testimony of faithfulness, selflessness, unity, love, and grace of the believers, it's very difficult to make good evidence for the power of the resurrection. You go and tell people about the resurrection, the power of the resurrection, and you go around living as if you yourself have not been resurrected from the dead, it's going to be very difficult for people to see power in it. You follow me? You go and preach the power of Christ and Him resurrected from the dead and the benefits of that to you and me. And if I live a life powerless of that great resurrection power, you know what it sounds like? It sounds like a hypocrite talking. That's what it sounds like. So I testify that this great power that the apostles went out and preached and testified of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, it was easier for those unbelievers out there to look at the community that they came from and said, oh, believe you me, there's power there. You believe what Barnabas did last week? That guy Barnabas sold his land over there and took all the money that he got from the land and he gave it to the whole church because there were people that had needs in there. That's resurrection power, isn't it? The church had the evidence of life in harmony with the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. They had the evidence of love. The very love of Christ. And I quote again what we've already said this morning. A new commandment I give unto you that you love one another even as I have loved you. What will happen because of that? By this shall all men know that you are what? My disciples. Your testimony, your unity, your one-heartedness, your one life, your one soul, all of this that I've created and you maintain to keep, all of that is going to go out into the world and it's going to express these people have been done, something has been done to them by the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ and you see the power of his resurrection in those people, amen? That's what it looks like. Powerful. Not only was there great power, but there was great grace. I love those two words. Great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and great grace was upon them all. What is that? What, what does that look like? Does that mean that there is just this shadow of divine grace? Over? What does it mean? Divine grace, great grace, powerful grace, glorious grace, amazing grace was upon them all. There was a beauty, there was a glory that was manifest in their own character. And that beauty and that grace cooperated with the apostolic testimony of the resurrection. What they're preaching isn't false, but how do you know? Look at the way they live. Look at how they love one another. Look at how they care. Look at how they're concerned. Look at the unity that they have amongst themselves. Certainly, this Jesus rose from the dead, and the power of him is in each one of them. Amen? That's Christianity. They don't lay down like dogs. They don't run away. When the going gets tough, they all swarm around each other. When someone has a need, they come together. They meet that need. They pray for one another. They love one another. The power of the resurrection that they're preaching is evidenced in their lives. 
Is it in yours? That's application, isn't it? Is it in yours? There was a beauty. There was a glory manifest in their own character. That grace, that beauty that was manifested there cooperated with the gospel. We've said it before, I'll say it again, there's nothing more ugly. There is nothing more ugly than someone who is living a life in terrible sin or disunity from the corporate gathering of the church and proclaiming Jesus as if he has the power to cleanse. It will turn your stomach. The resurrection they proclaimed was shown forth in the lives. Last, but certainly not least, we have a particular illustration of this in Joseph, who was surnamed Barnabas by the apostles. I think this is perhaps Luke introducing Barnabas. Barnabas, a very important figure in the book of Acts. He's mentioned 23 times in the book of Acts, Barnabas is, 23 times. That's significant, isn't it? But he himself is an example of this. It says in verse 36, And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Barnabas is an example. He's an illustration of what they were doing. Barnabas, whose name was Joseph, and apparently the apostles saw fit to change his name or to call his surname Barnabas, a son of consolation, a man who comes alongside and consoles. Sometimes there's just some Christian person in your life comes alongside of you. And he's like a Barnabas. He's a son of consolation. He's one that comes alongside, puts his arm around you, and shows you an example of the Lord Jesus Christ and encourages you to keep going. Barnabas will learn, goes on his missionary journey with Paul, buddies up with the great apostle Paul, and goes and testifies the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. But here he's showing forth an example. Probably a fairly wealthy man owns a home, he sells it and he brings the money and says, here you go, Peter, here you go, John. Whoever needs. If anyone needs, this is what, they, this is what I can give. He gives it all. I have people in my life that are like that Barnabas. I praise God for them. I mention one because I think he's a humble man and he won't get his head puffed up at all over this. <laughs> John Goble has been that man to me. And I love you. I've never ever had John come and uh, complain or murmur or get mad. And Sometimes he probably should have been, but he hadn't. Thank God, I can mention many others. Thank God for the people, the sons of consolation that come and not only encourage you by word, but they encourage you by what they do. They encourage you by what they've done. Barnabas comes and he's living by example, isn't he? He's showing you the way it's done. He's showing you his love for Christ. And because he has a love for Christ, he has a love for you. And he shows that and expresses it. This is what community life is all about. This is what being a member of the body of Christ looks like. This is the community to which we have, by divine grace, united ourselves to. Community life means mission and mutual care. 
You can't walk out those doors preaching Jesus and the power of the resurrection if you don't come in these doors and care about one another and love one another the same way Jesus loved you. It doesn't go together, does it? Both have to be true. Yes, we're concerned about the salvation of the lost. Yes, we're concerned about missions and sharing the gospel and going out into our community. Yes, we're concerned all about the power of the gospel going forth and saving souls. But if that does not line up with the way we love one another in here, it won't work. It will not work. You'll have a church filled with Ananias and Sapphira. You'll have a church filled in Acts chapter 6 when the Hellenistic Jews aren't getting the right amount of food. Everybody's ticked off at everybody. And before you know it, we've got to have this and that going on and appoint people here and get all this going over here. And we've got, we got to keep trying to put a Band-Aid on everything. No, community life means both mission and mutual care. We care about Christ. Therefore, we care about those Christ loves. You're in Christ Jesus this morning. We have a mutual concern and care for one another because we have a mission that we've all been called to. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for these words. Convicting as they are, Lord, we would ask that you might help us by divine grace to continue to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace as Paul commands us. We pray, Father, that you would help us to 